Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Self Reg Show. This is our podcast where we talk about all things Self Reg and related to Self Reg. And I'm really excited to be here uh, with friends and partners uh, of the Merit Center. It's the the team from the Mentoree, and we're we're just so we're celebrating that they have a new chapter coming out. Um, on mentoring. It's like linking mentoring and well-being, and we're going to hear all about that. We're going to talk about the links to self-reg within that. But before we get started, I'm just wondering, Noah, Terry, and Christine, can you tell the, the audience, the viewers, the listeners a little bit about yourselves? Let's start there. Hello and welcome to, see, I'm new. I I'm also have to tell everybody out there, you might laugh at this, but I, I said at the beginning of, of today, before we, we even went online, that I was a little nervous today because I'm literally on a podcast with three very experienced podcasters, but, but especially one, and that's Noah Daniel, who I would consider the queen of podcasting. I've, I've been a guest on a couple of her shows in the past, and uh, you know I think you could do this with your eyes closed. So, so, so the pressure's high. <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> we're nothing if not real here on the self Reg Show. So welcome, everyone. I'm really glad you're here. Thank you so much for having us. All of this actually started on a podcast. And the podcast that just turned seven on Ed Mentors, I started as a panelist. So I'm really excited to have helped to develop and bring together this team that has become the mentee and serves so many educators around the world. Well, and thank you. Noah, tell, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. So it's not just that you are, and I did meet you on um, the Voice Ed Radio, I think for the very first time, but you're a whole lot of things besides just a podcaster. Tell everyone well, a little I'm, bit about yourself. Thanks, Susan. Mostly I'm a teacher and everything that I do is really about teaching. I teach part-time in a public board, the York Region District School Board. I also run a consulting practice called Building Outside the Blocks, and the mentory falls under that. And I'm also a children's book author and a speaker, and I do everything really because I love education in all of its forms. <laughs> Lovely. And and Terry, can you introduce uh, yourself? Sure. Thanks, Susan. I uh, wear a variety of hats as well. So you know, the more the more that grows, the harder it is for me to figure out how to introduce myself. I am the programming and research coordinator at the Mentory, which is a, a big part of why I'm here having this conversation. I'm also an online learning facilitator at the Merit Center. So Yay. writing this chapter was really an amazing opportunity for to, to bring those worlds together, to bring that work together. So I'm really excited about that. Um, prior to, to these roles, I was uh, and am a teacher, uh, but I used to work also at the York Region District School Board as a classroom teacher, a special education teacher, a consultant. So I've held a variety of roles. And uh, now my work in a variety of ways is connected to supporting teachers as they do their amazing work in classrooms with students. Lovely, and we, and we love having you facilitating courses and doing other things for us as well, Terry. Christine? Hi everyone, my name is Christine Chin and I also am an educator. Uh, have been for the past, I keep saying 15, and then someone was like, actually, Christine, it's been 18. So it's 18 years of being a French immersion teacher. Uh, this year, I've been so, so lucky to be able to continue in my role as a curriculum consultant, supporting new teachers in the new teacher induction program. Uh, I also work for a board in Ontario. Um, but I love, love, love being able to do this work with my lovely counterparts, Terry and Noah. Um, it's really crazy because we do so much of our work virtually and the three of us have actually gone together, what a total of three times maybe uh -huh. in real life, despite the fact that we actually live relatively close to each other. Like when Terry, when you're in town and everything. So uh, I'm very, very, very grateful to have the opportunity to do the work with these lovely ladies. <laughs> There's so many links to the Merit Center. We're like that as well. I mean, we have people that work in different parts of the country, uh, for sure. But the, the the core sort of the admin team is is all within about an hour's drive. And we don't see each other very much either. And we're like a few minutes away from one another. <laughs> and yet you can still have these deep relationships, right? So it's, it's interesting how we're like a family. Well, you have sparked my interest, and I told you I was going to ask this. How did you all come together? So you have, you're all, you all identified as a teacher, which I find cool. That's sort of when I think, what, you know, how I first, what, what, what do I say when I say who I am? I think of that as a piece of it. But such a rich variety of, of experience and areas of, 
expertise and passion? Like what, how did the three of you come together in the first place? So I had been on the On Ed Mentor show as a panelist for about a year. And what we were doing to support free service teachers was pretty amazing, but I couldn't help like noticing the power of being on a panel of educators who were listening to and learning from each other. And I was like, hold on. And I said to the then host, Derek Rodenizer, and to Stephen Hurley, who does the audio production and who's the reason why we are live, um, that I wanted to do something with the show to kind of take it into the world. And they were like, go ahead, Noah, like, let's see what you do. And I had my life transformed by mentorship. I went later in my career, I had gone on to a school and I was kind of brought to that school and Ricky Wartzman was what they called a curriculum coach. And she was working with new teachers. And I said, I'm a new teacher. And they were like, no, no, you've been teaching for 20 years. Like you're not new. And I'm like, but I'm, I'm new to this school and I'm new to this context. And I would really love the support. And I began meeting with this woman who not only helped me navigate some very difficult times, but really helped me find myself as an educator. And I thought, why couldn't I pay that forward? And then this show happened. And then I had this vision of a community where we could connect with mentors and as educators have agency over our learning through mentorship. And so I found a partner at the time in Lee Castle who was running the digital human library and she had a lot of the technological infrastructure, but at one point we needed to bring on a team and it was just crazy how the rest of it evolved. So I'm going to invite Terry and Christine to tell us how they came to be part of that team. Christine, do you want to go first? You can go first. I'm all good. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I was thinking about uh, this question and I try, you know, trying to remember. I mean, Noah and I have known each other for many years um, from a variety of contexts. And my first involvement with the mentory was as a mentor, which I still am. And I know, Susan, you know Hoda, my mentee, who I've worked with for many years. And I, I can't remember, Noah, like how we connected when I first got involved with the mentoring as a mentor, but as you mentioned, when you and Lee decided that, you know, you wanted to build a leadership team and we were talking and I remember you said to me one day, do you want to be on the leadership team? And I said, yes, I do. And you said, what role would you like? And I said, I don't know. I said, (laughs) we sort of figured it out as we went along, but I knew that this was something so exciting and so amazing to be part of that, to be able to grow my involvement I sort of jumped at the chance, even though I really had no idea what I was getting myself into. But still, you know, low these many years later, grateful for all these opportunities that have come through this work. Um, and that's sort of how I, I jumped in. Uh, similarly, I think I jumped in when, um, I guess we were on a, I forget how, were we on a call? I don't know, but you and Lee had put out the call for like, who wants to be on the leadership team? Who wants to help us out with some stuff? And I was at a point in my career, um, probably, I don't know, 13, 12 years, 12, 13 years in, where I kind of had that itch of really wanting to do something more. Um, but I had two kids at home, and it wasn't going to be like I was going to go down that VP path just yet, because I wanted to have the flexibility of being a mom. Um, and so this really provided me with that opportunity to kind of feel like I was some, getting some leadership, doing something really cool outside of school, but that wasn't super time consuming. Um, I could kind of like do bits and pieces when I had time to do them. So uh, for me, uh, that was a huge part of it is really just trying to find something outside of school that kind of filled my bucket a little bit um, as I was kind of continuing to progress in my career. Uh, But I think that we really came together as a team when, you know, we really started to try to put the vision of this mentorship community together. And so I was uh, taking care of a lot of the digital infrastructure part. So like the website, that type of stuff. Um, And yeah, it's been a really, really great collaboration ever since. I just love that. And, And as I hear the three of you speak, what's jumping out to me is, is there's an organic nature to this. And I think that's actually really special about so those of you out there listening that are like I know mentor I have mentors in my life you know I I have been part of mentoring programs on both ends um, and the ones that are still met that that I had those relationships with all came, Stuart Shanker's one all came about 
it, there was an organic nature to it. Nobody, you know, it was, it was a choice. And it was really interesting. I realized that I, I knew about the mentory and I knew about Noah. I actually was told about Noah from your sister. <laughs> I met your sister through like my daughter, basically. And she was like, you got to follow my, my sister. And I'm like, I know that name. And I looked her up and I said, that's sort of, I was sort of, I came across you, you know, all the, you know, six degrees of separation and all that. And, and so, you know, you hear mentoring and you're like, okay, well, I know mentoring, mentoring is a good thing and all that, but there's something different about what you do, which I'm going to get to asking why you wrote this chapter. But one of the lens on, from my perspective ties to what you just said, Terry, you said, I have met your, your, men, uh, your, your mentee, um, Hoda. And, I, so I knew about this organization. I knew it was there was an organic nature. I knew you had a lot of following and people were speaking very, very highly of you, um, including Stephen Hurley, or I think a lot of. Um, but then I met, we were running, at the time we were on Twitter, we've now come off Twitter for lots of good reasons, um, but we were running Twitter chats. And uh, I knew Terry already, um, but there, t- Terry was showing up with her, her mentee, Hoda, who I got to know through like, two years, I think, of, of participating in most of these these Twitter chats. Maybe it was a little less. And I went to do a speaking engagement one night, and I, I'm walking into it. I didn't know anybody in the audience. It was a Friday night, at, you know, and it was a small group that were there. And at the end, someone comes up, and she's coming straight to, can I hug you? And it's Hoda. You know, it's this person that I got to know through Twitter. But you would show up each month, and you would do this chat together to various topics. And there was just something so organic and incredible about the relationship. And like, she couldn't have said enough good things about you, Terry, in this case, but Terry, you couldn't have said enough good things about Hoda. And it just, all, it, it was, it was sort of the, like, w- there was all kinds of reasons why I was interested in what the mentory did and you align with us, but that kind of solidified, okay, there is something here that everybody can learn from. So, you know, I just, I, I, I'm really excited you're here. So tell us about this chapter and I'm going to read it. The title is Creating a Supportive Virtual Mentorship Community for Educators Through the Mentory, and it's part of a whole series called Mentoring for Well-Being in Schools, and I love that it's linked to the topic of well-being. So tell, so tell me, why did, you, why did you write the chapter? How did that come about? Well, as the founder and director of the Mentory, I'm kind of that person who is like, okay, guys, it's time to you know, rejig the website, it's time to, and I said, guys, it's time to start sharing with a a wider audience what we do. I think that, you know, when the pandemic happened, the mentory really evolved into becoming who we are. Lee separated, went on to do her thing, and I dug deeper into what we were doing, and we did some strategy work um, with some marketing people, and then we did some strategy work with my mentor, Karen Friedman, and through the strategic development, really um, aligned ourselves with what we had been doing, but in a very articulate and clear manner. And once we came up with our goal statement, we started to really see the different offerings that we had at the Mentory as something distinctive. And as we tried it and gathered more data from participants, um, the vision was actually becoming a reality. And it's kind of incredible. So that's where writing um, captures a moment in time, I think. And I blog, but I certainly didn't have the audience that I needed to talk about something so distinctive, especially on the mentorship landscape. And the more research we were doing about what mentorship was out there, the more it was a program that had this definite beginning and definite ending. And we talk about it in the chapter, you know, so often mentorship is geared to pre-service teachers or new teachers, and then not again until you go through the administration process. And in education, the ebb and flow of life in education is changed. That's the constant. So how are we going to tool educators to manage this, this never-ending learning and to really be able to look at it from an asset lens requires a mentorship mindset to know you're not stuck and you don't have to isolate yourself to manage the winds of change that mentorship can walk with you at every and any stage of your career. Lovely. And I've read the chapter. I've skimmed. Uh, no, I haven't just skimmed. I've read the chapter and it is, it is an incredible chapter. And so anybody that's interested in even grounding it in some of the research and understandings and, you know, getting even to some of the different, different approaches to mentoring, like it's just really so well done. Will you just, will someone jump in and just tell me a little bit so that we're working with a couple of ideas about what mentoring is and how it might look a little bit differently. So I, the formal and informal was one that you spoke about, but just, just to anchor that before I, 
before we go any further. You know, I, so I'm just uh, still stuck. Am I allowed to go back and think, you know, respond to the first question? Yes. I don't, Sorry, so did so I mess I up? <laughs> no, no, not at all. I'm just thinking, okay, yeah, that's an important question that you just asked, but I'm still thinking about the one before. Because, you know, I love how Noah's framing sort of the big picture of the work and wanting to get our, our message out and communicate about what we're doing. But it was interesting to think about this chapter in particular because it's looking at the well-being aspect. And of course, you know, our work touches on more than that. Um, but that is such a critical component of the work. And I think that, you know, there is so much um, discussion and conversation these days about student well-being. And that's so important. But as yeah. Stuart says, the well-being of children is inseparable from the well-being of the critical adults in their lives. How are we making sure that we're supporting the well-being of the teachers so that they can in turn support the well-being of their students? So having this opportunity to talk about mentorship through that lens um, and, and bring what we're doing um, in support of that, you know, out to be able to share it to a broader audience is, I think, a, a really exciting piece of this particular chapter and the focus of, of this work that I think was really pretty, pretty exciting. But I think also maybe this connects to, Susan, to your more recent question. As, you know, we went into writing of the chapter with ideas of what it was we wanted to share and then did additional research as we were developing the chapter. And we really, it helped to um, clarify sort of what's different about our work. And there are, you know, there are many things, but, um, you know, one of the things to just to start us off thinking about this is, well, some you've mentioned. So the organic nature of the work. Um, we sit sort of at that intersection between formal and informal. We, we support, we have a process for bringing people together. We um, provide resources to support the building of those relationships, but we don't mandate that you use them in a particular way. We yeah. support mentorship throughout, the, I, I don't know, I call it a career span. I don't know if that's a thing. Um, you know, there's so much research out there that looks, there's a lot of research that looks at mentorship for early career educators, or new teachers, novice teachers, and you can see that different language out there. Um, there is also research that looks at pre-service teachers, teachers, more experienced teachers and mentorship, but it's all sort of discrete and separate pieces. And, you know, our work is really about supporting at all of those stages and through all of those stages. So it may be that you come in and out of the mentorship, but we can also support through the transitions. And I think that that's a really important piece because we know that those transitions can be stressors, whether it's from pre-service to novice educator you know, once you're already teaching, you switch schools, as Noah was referring to, or you move into a new role and you're, in, there's all kinds of reasons why mentorship can be valuable in supporting well-being at any stage of your career. There was one other thing I was going to say and now it's gone. So I'll open it up if anybody else wants to jump in there while I try to remember what I was going to say. I think I will add that <clears throat> I think what differentiates us um, also is the agency piece. And I think that so often when we're being asked to enter into a mentorship relationship, sometimes it's mandated for a variety of different reasons. But the what uh, the what of uh, that's being discussed is often also very much guided by a program, whatever it may be. And I know that in my um in my career, there have been, you know, times where I really want to learn about this, or I really want to learn about that. And having the agency to be like, I'm going to pick this person because they have, you know, some passion and some expertise about that is, I think, what really helps differentiate us. We have such a wonderful community of mentors who um, have passion and who have expertise and who are so excited and wanting to share about a variety of different things that if you're really, really looking to kind of find someone who's going to support you about a specific uh, topic or a specific um, area, that's what we can provide. And I think that sometimes it can be really challenging, especially as an experienced teacher, to find a community of people who are so willing to share without feeling like, oh, if I ask this person, are they going to say no? And I just think what's so wonderful about the mentoree is that you have some choice and you know that everyone in the community is all, has already said yes to being that person. And so I think that it can be really helpful to um, 
have that reassurance because there is vulnerability in saying, hey, I want to know more about this. I don't know about this. And so that's what's really wonderful about our community. Everyone who has signed up to be a mentor has already said, yeah, I want to share. I'm interested in entering into this relationship with you. So I think that that can be really reassuring um, to be able to find someone who's already said yes. And it's also reassuring to ha uh, have the agency to find someone who wants to support you in whatever topic it is that you're looking for. So. I think that that's what really differentiates with the work that we do. I love that you tied agency in there because that also speaks to um, the power relationship. And, and you know, you, you really emphasize, um, I, I know it, it's reciprocal. And I think you also talk about like it's not top down, which we tend to even in a lovely, the loveliest of mentoring situations. You know, I had someone that was my, was a boss and he was, it was like a hierarchical. I had a huge amount of respect for him. He made, made a huge difference in my, my life and my career. And then we worked on a journal together. It was very strange, but I, there was a, a power differential that, that sort of happened. And so that agency is really, no, this is really a reciprocal, reciprocal, which ties to self reg, you know, and especially this idea of individual differences. You know, there is no one size fits all. Um, that it really allows and agencies tied right into that. So you you all chose intentionally, like there is over like over three and a, I think it's three and a half pages of, of, of citations, re references in this chapter. This is a well-researched chapter and, you know, self-reg is a piece of it, but there's a whole lot more than just self-reg, you know, but, but self-reg is, has, it, it does come through as a bit of an anchor and, and a freight. You've used some elements of the framework um, as, as part of your chapter and how you frame that the work that the mentoree does. Can you, can you, can someone tell me about why, why you chose to bring self-reg into this chapter? I'm going to let Terry speak it more specifically, but she has been a grounding force to ensure that the language of self-reg, the processes of self-reg are what we do at the mentory. And there's so many times that she uses language and just using the term shifts, you know, how you see a situation. So she'll reframe a situation and she'll be like, what stressors are involved? We'll look at the different domains and we'll be talking about it. So that, that complete, you know, synthesis of her as a self-regger. She's yeah. not fully, like this is who she is and what she brings to our learning. And so much of self-reg helps us to help our mentees to create scenarios like these safe havens where they are non-judgmental and they are non-hierarchical. And that whole idea that everybody can learn from each other and that mentor's whole role could be to co-regulate. Like, that we can't see our work anymore separate from the influence of self-reg. And really that's, as much as I love self-reg, I'm not as knowledgeable as Terry. So to have that constant influx of learning and language has really shaped our work. Terry, please go ahead. <laughs> no, that was beautiful. I, you know, it, it's, I'll, I'll just start by sharing a little bit of my self-reg journey and then how, you know, these worlds collided. Um, you know, I, I don't even know how many years ago now, but I started, um, well, actually, it was as an early years consultant in Ontario when the 2016 kindergarten program um, was released and Stuart's work is embedded throughout that. And at that time, I was a special education consultant on the early years team supporting the implementation of that document. So I think that that was where a lot of it started for me, I do remember, I think maybe even prior to that, um, reading Calm Alert and Learning, also probably through the school board that that was shared. And then um, a few years later, I was on a leave from the board and thinking I should take a course because I always want to take a course. What should I take? Mm -hmm. And I started um, thinking about self-reg courses and, and debating between starting with the Early Childhood Development Program or Foundations. And I think it may have actually been Jamie who I had a conversation with way back then and trying to decide. So I started with early childhood development. I loved it. Then I thought, oh, I would love to take the facilitators course, but I don't know enough yet. I'll take the foundations program. And so I did that. And anyway, so, as you know, and as I learn more about self-reg, I realize how much I still need to learn. And it's just been an amazing journey of growth. And like so many of my teacher colleagues, and we know self-reg is for all of us, it's not just about those of us who are working in education, but like so many of my teacher colleagues who take a self-reg course thinking, this will help me support my students. 
it becomes a life changing experience. And it, it, it yeah. just it is a mindset shift and it changes all of your relationships for the better, I think. Um, and it does become how you see things. So, you know, I know I'm Christine. Well, you know, luckily they're very patient with me as I say in response to everything. Well, as you know, I think about that through a self-reg lens. I layer a self-reg lens onto everything. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, personally and professionally. So, you know, we were doing this mentor mentorship work. We knew from the outset that well-being was a critical component. And then as I started learning about more about self-reg, it was like, ah, okay, this gives us the language and the framework to articulate what we knew, but didn't really know exactly how to communicate. Uh, so it helps us to be more strategic and intentional about the well-being component of mentorship. And uh, I think it's been really, really exciting. And there are these parallels as we talk about process over program through mentorship, through self-reg, right? We want it to be individualized. We want it to be grounded in relationships. That's what it's all about. We, so, you know, all of those sort of foundational pieces align so well with our thinking about, about mentorship and really it was so exciting for me personally, personally, professionally, to be able to bring these, these worlds together. And, you know, I think about, and I'll just tell this story and let, and let, and let others jump in. But, you know, when I think about um, particularly, I don't know why this jumps out for me when I started as my first role as a consultant. So it was brand new and it was terrifying. I mean, it was amazing. I loved every minute of it. Okay, not every minute, but most minutes. Um, it was amazing. But I remember I started and I had so many questions and so much uncertainty. And I shared an office with uh, another consultant who'd been in the role already for a year or two. And we were in and out of the office all the time. And so I would accumulate questions and I would like have this pile of sticky notes. And, you know, when, when, she, would, when she and I would be in the office at the same time, and it was just such a co-reg moment I didn't have that language back yeah. then but she co-regulated me I felt supported because I knew there would be that time where she would walk in and we would be able to sit down and go through my questions so you know I think about that when I think about the work we're doing now so when you know you have a mentor even though they're not with you in that moment that you're doing something in your classroom in your context knowing that you have that time set, a set aside where they're going to be available to you. They can help you think things through. They can answer your questions. They can share information with you. That is so regulating. It's mm -hmm. so calming. It's so amazing to know um, that, that's, that that's available to you. And, you know, the reciprocal nature of the relationship. Right? You know, I like to think, yes, I'm a co-regulator co for my mentee, but I can't tell you how many times she's been that person for me. So it goes both ways and I will, I will pause there. I love talking about all of this, but I will pause and let others jump in. I've definitely received some of your sticky note questions. <laughs> if I ever do a webinar with, which I love, cause you, 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 you push, you push it in a good way too. Like you ask deep, deep questions, but, but sometimes it's like, I never thought about that. <laughs> and off I go, you know, researching, trying to figure things out. So really interesting. Did anyone else want to jump in on that? I like, uh, Susan, when we were writing, we've never written like this together. And there was so much of that. Like each of us brought our unique selves to this process. I think we know each other better now, but we have a, you know, a self-regulating effect on each other um, and a co-regulating effect. Like I can't, this team of, of mentoring each other, whether it's a, a phone call of something that happened at work or something that's coming up, like the three of us meet officially once a week, but writing this chapter deepened our relationship because we were having really intense conversations and pushing back with each other on a lot of things that were stressors for us. Things for me, I know like APA citations are very difficult, but Terry yeah. was like the, the guiding force with so many of the academic pieces to this. Like I stream of consciousnessly wrote 30 pages to start. And then we all kind of went back and be like, okay, now I like let's do some focusing. <laughs> so how, yeah. how we show up and the safety that we have with each other to show up as ourselves and to help each other be our best selves, whether it's as teachers or leaders or as mentors, 
it's really, um, it's a powerful relationship that I think models our, our work at the same time. Love that. I, I'm good. You know, I'm going to see if we can take an opportunity here because uh, what you've just shared is really interesting. Like I love how self rig was aligned with you because it, as you said, it gave you some language, but it also validated some of the things you were already doing and seeing, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and, and then what I'm hearing is it also gave us new ways of thinking, new, new ways of reflecting, you know, the, the, whether it's using the whole framework or whatever, the dif different questions to begin to wonder about why, but that was a really neat example that you just gave Noah, where on this book. So anybody out there listening to this, you know, that has, has had to collaborate with colleagues, whether you have a choice or not, right? When you've had to collaborate with others and work together, it, it does, it has, it has tensions, you know, it has moments, we have different viewpoints. It's, but, but when we're, we're, when we're doing it together, that that's how we get to a richer pro, you know, product at the end. But can you use that example and talk about what some of the stressors were? So we, you know, when we talk about the five domains of stress in self-reg, it's biological, emotion, cognitive, social, pro-social. Don't worry if you you know, don't specify which ones, but what were some of the stressors in, in the process of this very close collaborative team in developing this chapter? Christine? I think that some of the stressors, so first off, um, this type of writing, I, I will be completely honest, is not my forte in the least. Like the whole research part of it is not something that I relish. So I think that what was helpful maybe for all of us too is that I think we all know each other's strengths. And so like, I knew that this is like, this is Terry's jam. She loves this. So I was like, I will contribute in a different way. So I think that some of the stressors for me anyway, for my part, was just really making sure that I was contributing um, in a good way to the way to, to this work. Because like I said, the actual writing of the research and all of those pieces, not my jam. Um, but I think so that I think was one of the stressors for me anyway. Um, I think another part of the stressor was just the conciseness um, that we had to have in order to, to do this. Like Noah was just saying, like, she could write, you know, she could write 100 pages on the work that we do with no problem yeah. and with a giant smile on her face um, <laughs> and so excited to share every, you know, story, everything that we've ever done. So I think the conciseness, um, like you said, Noah, the APA part of it. But I also think the organization, I think that like we really struggled to figure out like what part should go first. Like all of those logistical pieces were really, really challenging, I think. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is fun to listen to. Um, it's, you know, now that I, no, I so appreciate it, Christine. <laughs> like it's funny because it, it ties back to, you know, where we started in this conversation, you know, our relationship that developed, you know, so organically, but that, you know, we each bring different things to the work and that are so complimentary. And uh, I, I think it's just sort of amazing how that, how that happened. And for sure, Noah, you know, I, cause Susan and I think we're stream of consciousness. Noah's, Noah's stream of consciousness. And, but it's, you know, and then I'm slash and burn, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all work through, but it's interesting when Christine talks about the organization, because for all of us, like I have a lot of experience with academic writing as a student. So going through a publication process was new for, well, I mean, mm -hmm. Noah has been through it with her children's books and, you know, different kinds of work, but, you know, in this kind of setting, this was new for all of us. So we were trying to figure it out as we went. And, you know, if we're going to be really, you know, transparent about the process, we had our draft, we send it in, it gets, you know, comes back from the editors with all these suggested revisions. And that was a little daunting. Yeah. And I think part of it is that it's a style of writing. It's not just that it's academic writing, but we're trying to tap into the research, but at the same time, talk about an existing, um, I don't want to use the word program, but, you know, the structure of our work and what we offer. And that's a different kind of writing. And so it was trying to figure out how do we connect the pieces of what we do, the different types of mentorship we offer, how we operate with all the research and where do we structure it and how do we put it all together. So it was absolutely a learning curve. I do really enjoy doing the research and the writing, but it's like there's this fine line, you know, with the, yes, I enjoy it, but it doesn't mean it's not a struggle and that there aren't stressors um, across domains because we do approach work differently. Um, 
and not, you know, there's the social, social stressors of not wanting to um, step on anybody's toes, but to find a place where we can be honest uh, and, and talk also about how we each, you know, we just have different ways of approaching the work and then figuring out how to make it, you know, meld together. Um, you know, I'm doing a quick, like I'm thinking through, you know, stressors across domains as we have this conversation, but yeah, for sure. There are lots of stressors that um, bubble up along the way, but then you learn a lot from figuring out how to tackle those things within that safe space that, that we have created. And Noah, what are your thoughts on this one? I have so many thoughts, but I want to focus on the editing process and really shout out to the editors, Ben and Francis, like what, when we first got um, the suggested revisions, it's very humbling, we'll say. It's also <laughs> been there. <laughs> That was the first time, like, except for when I was doing, you know, my master's work and, you know, you got some feedback here and there. This was like a very intense emotional experience. And like any learner, you want to embrace feedback and you want to be able to grow from feedback. But we had to go through the stress of it not being good enough and kind of get into that that thinking of, well, they're making it better. They're not here to criticize our thinking. They're here to invite us to look at other opportunities to, you know, justify our point of view and substantiate our ideas. And it was an incredible opportunity. Our work is so much better as a result of this. Some of the people that we brought in, like sometimes you have this low hanging fruit and you're like, well, of course I should have reference these people but how did I not reference these people so we started bringing in more articles and Terry and I were like having fun throwing research yeah. at each other like okay this will go and then I I really embraced it in a different way that way because yeah. I kind of started it Terry Terry went next and then Christine went next and we went to crystallizing and crystallizing so through the editing process like for our last revision we sat for about two and a half hours over the winter break we, it was our last chance to revise this piece and we had to think about little things like calling it twitter and not putting x in the in the bracket and like little things that we wanted to have longevity and meaning outside of the immediate context of where when we were writing so thinking about those kinds of things it's very different than when you're writing a children's book and it's very different thinking about the audience of this being able to be internationally recognized um, not just as leading mentorship work, but as voices in a space full of incredible people who have done unbelievable things, not just in education, but to make the world better. And to see that there was this influx of mentorship and coaching conversations that were coming up almost at the exact same time, like this symbiotic moment where it was like, yes, we were supposed to be telling our story right exactly now. So we're at the precipice of something, I believe, in sharing this work and getting this time with you to talk about it. Like, it, it's really poetic for me listening to <laughs> the chap The chapter, I, I mean, I've already said that, was absolutely fantastic. So good job for the editors. And they really do make it better at the end, you know. And I can see so many links. I'm going to tie us back to the idea of mentoring when I ask that question because it, it really is – there's a mentorship relationship between there, there's a co-regulation relationship between the three of you. And I, I mean, I can think of, of it applying to, I think in, in your book, in your chapter, you talk about how, um, uh, you know, many uh, new teachers. So nov novice, te I don't know if I like that, that statement, but whatever the, the newer teachers, yeah. as you said, it's finding the right words. They're often looking for that just in time kind of mentoring. It's like, Oh my God, this happened today. <gasps> What do I do? You know, that kind of mentoring versus someone that has been, you know, teaching for 20 years and is in a new community. They're more trying to, you know, maybe under, maybe they're working on a specific goal, the agency that Christine talked about, or maybe they're trying to get to know the community, you know, so there's, there's different, there's different kinds of mentoring, but it's really interesting that, that like when I, when I hear you, I hear, okay, you're doing this there's timelines, there's deadlines, right? So those are stressors. You, Some of you would have been great with deadlines and some of you would have been me. <laughs> I'm like, no, right? So, I mean, there's those kind of stressors. There's getting the feedback, which you can get a sense of injustice, which, you know, or also, you know, you're kind of kicking yourself for not, not having caught something the first time. And that's just, those are just stressors, you know, telling you a false story in your brain, right? But there's all kinds there's that you're working on it digitally, you know, I don't know if you had multiple draft 
stressors, <laughs> you know, oh, draft 2.6 and 2. Point, you know, that kind of thing. So there's so many stressors and it's really interesting how self-reg, you know, just using the sort of the, even the, just the five domain element of it, you know, in, in terms of, of trying to work through something as a team can, can be helpful. And it, it's not that it solves everything, but it's like, okay, this is just stressors. We're okay. <laughs> you know, and you stay collaboratively through to the end. So I'm really curious about you, you in your, um, in your, it's, I think it's your goal statement. You re- referenced it earlier. Um, uh, uh, Noah did, I think, but it says uh, it, we aim to collect, this is the statement that they came together um, and Noah talked about earlier in the podcast and got really clear on, okay, who are we and what are we doing? You know, what's our next, what's our next chapter of our, of our, of our, of our organization, but to cultivate a collaborative mentorship community for educators grounded in these three things, professional, professional learning, well-being and efficacy. So that, that was, that's kind of a neat trio. And I think all of those words have come up. Can you tell me how, how you see um, the connection between those three things in the work that you do and wh- how it might show, what it might look like in mentoring, how it might show up in the work that you do at the mentoree? Can, can I jump into that one? I'm like, I could talk all day, so please somebody else. <laughs> Yeah. I just, I, I, cause I just love this quote. And if I may, you know, put a plug in for Susan and Stewart's book, um, the self-reg schools handbook for educators, which is, you know, always by my side. Uh, <laughs> well, keys, yeah. Cause yeah. I just, there's this, this particular quote that I think really connects all of those three pillars that we talk about in our work and links it to self-reg. So I just, I love it. So, and it's, you know, from the first page of the preface or the very first page of the book. So that our biological reactions to stress can consume a great deal of energy. So by learning how to self-regulate effectively, we reduce the cost of these responses and free up energy for other important functions, such as problem solving and learning. And the reason I like to use that to answer this type of question is that I see self-reg supporting the well-being of Mm -hmm. teachers and once we are regulated then that frees up energy for the professional learning that leads to the sense of efficacy right so that's how i see all those three pieces connected it's almost like self-reg is like the the connector between all of those three pillars because you can't have you know one without the other we need to be, you know, like calm, alert, and we want our students to be calm, alert, and ready to learn. As teachers, we have to be calm, alert, and ready to learn. That, you know, as and as we learn, we feel a greater sense of efficacy. And, you know, it, it just keeps, um, it's a recursive process. And I, that's how I see them as interconnected. Love that. Anyone else want to add in? <laughs> well, yes, I do. <laughs> one of the things that I think um, when I hear you saying that it, it's the conduit that self drug is the conduit through which all these things happen and you know you go to when we, we re- reference that whole concept of ballroom PD you go to different professional and they're, they're called professional development opportunities but you can't develop unless you change and in order to go through a change you need to be in the right mental state your brain needs to be open and you know talking about being calm and alert there are so many stressors happening right now in education the kids have changed so much and i'm I'm excited to come back to the the second part of the self-reg episode this year because self-reg really helps you look at your students with soft eyes and and really make sure that you're seeing who's in the room and teaching those people those wonderful people coming with more stress than ever before But also understand that teachers, especially here in Ontario, like even though our work is boardless and borderless, there are common themes happening and too much change too quickly without support is certainly one of them. And when funding is the the mode through which mentorship happens, then when that funding runs out or that time runs out, the mentorship is over. So coming back to this idea that with agency, we can get ourselves mentors at any stage for as long or short a time as we want to help us feel better about our work and ourselves. Because if I'm not stressing the whole time, I can actually listen to what I'm learning. I might be able to make that change in my pedagogy that isn't just in my thinking, that's actually in the action in the classroom. 
which serves students and they're they're learning more. So I feel a greater sense of efficacy. So that interconnected, that interwoven element of those three pillars of our work really require self-reg as the avenue through which to arrive at these things. So even though it looks like you're dealing with the well-being piece, you can't deal with the other pieces without it. And so I think so often professional learning is seen as something separate and we forget about the well-being and efficacy pieces that come with professional learning. And if you look at our offerings, like you can listen to the podcast on your own or you can listen to the broadcast live and you get resources being tweeted out from the panelists. So there's different dimensions that can meet people where they are. I love hearing from faculties when they listen to an episode and that they unpack it with the learning that they're doing so they know that it's relevant and it's responsive to the needs of educators. But when we have a conversation to build capacity, people come for a circle conversation or drop in for a casual conversation. We know that we are meeting people in a lot of different ways and creating different kinds of safe spaces for people to come and learn. And the mentors who have led MPACs, which are our three-part learning experiences, have done so under really intense pressures. Talk about de-streaming. I mean, the the high school teachers, the secondary teachers were told they had to de-stream, were given not a lot of support and thrown mm-hmm. into this. And we were feeling a lot of that stress. We had this incredible mentor experience, you know, with Melanie White leading these de-streaming English sessions really taking people through this change and and people were not feeling good. So yeah. when we hear feedback, not just that they feel better equipped, but that they feel better, that's, that's good work for us. That's anecdotal data that serves us to serve our community better. So the our three pillars are tied to everything that we do. It helps us when Terry's reminding me or Christine's like, no, I let's stay within the scope of what's possible. <laughs> They, they remind us, that it, is this serving our three things? And so it's helped yeah. us focus, but it's also really affirmed the work that we do um, in terms of the interconnection between those three parts. And if I can add, I think that it's a, definitely a situation where you can't have one without the other. And I think that yeah. both Terry and I have talked about that, right? And I think that especially this year in my work in supporting uh, new teachers, um, as they come into the profession, I have never heard more um, concern about the level of stress that they're finding and how hard it is um, to balance, uh, to to achieve that work-life balance. And I think that being able to approach and having some of the language about how mentorship can really help us with that self-regulating piece about getting to that work-life balance. um, I know that in the first five years of teaching, like I think we've all definitely Terry and both uh, and Noah, like we work really hard in that first five years. The learning curve of being a teacher is intense. Um, There's nothing that can kind of prepare you more for just having to like jump in. And all of a sudden you are in charge of 30, you know, students in your classroom with so many different needs. And that efficacy piece really gets thrown out the window just because of all of the things that you are all of a sudden responsible for. So I think that when we talk about that efficacy piece, we know that professional learning can help. But if you're already overwhelmed with just kind of getting through your day and you're just kind of holding your head above water mm-hmm. every day, trying to get in and out of school, self-regulation is really going to be really, really important, helping you make it through some of those challenges. Um, and I don't know how helpful it is, but I think it is helpful maybe to them. Um, I try to sound there's nothing more constant in education than change. And so we really need to work as educators, um, as people facilitating these giant ballroom professional development um, sessions, really think about how are we equipping uh, our new teachers in particular, or all teachers for that matter, with some of these self-regulating kind of strategies. And I think that mentorship is one of those things that can really help people understand that you're not in and alone. Um, There's always someone to reach out to. And that can really help us with that whole stress and support. We give tons of support sometimes, but the stress is not something that we tend to deal with. So I think it's really important that we continue to have these conversations about how mentorship can help us with that. I, I love it. And in what re, what it all reminds me of is how interconnected everything is, you know, and when we, we begin to um, realize that it's like, there's so many educators out there, so much on, on educators right now. There really and truly is. And 
then you can feel like you're not doing a good job or anything that you might fit under efficacy. You know, I can't reach these, these kids or I, you know, I, whatever, whatever it is that I should, 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 or, you know, I should have done. And, and at the end of the day, and there's different ways that we deal with that. I mean, we might be blaming, um, we might be like feeling really crappy ourselves and going home, like, you know, questioning or, you know, what, why we're doing what we're doing. And at the end of the day, when you begin to learn some of this science, like that's a, like, that's the root of, of, of self-reg when you're like, no, <laughs> you are capable, you really are incompetent and all of those things. But when, when our battery is on empty, when we're like really just pushing through the day, right? How can we, how can we be our best selves? How can we be our best educators? Like, how can we go home at night and, and feel like we had, you know, a good day and enjoy our, well, we can. And that's when, when you look at the well being is, is totally tied into all of that. And it's not like, oh, go have a bubble bath or, okay, everybody, let's deep breathe, you know? <laughs> That can be good. It's not that breathing is not important. It's actually one of the, you know, one of the things that we can tap into, but it's not that simple. And I find that a big shift can happen just from a little bit of compassion for yourself. And it's like, oh, there's more going on here. And hey, I, I think someone just said, maybe, maybe you, Christine, you're not alone, right? And and there's others with you. And oh, others are going through something similar, or this happened to me too. You know, it it it. it it, it's a bit of grounding in and of itself, just just that having that other person there makes sense. <laughs> well, I want to make sure yeah. that we, I want to ask a, a little bit if we can end today, um, just you, you've you highlighted some of the things the mentory does. I, 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 and, and there's so many resources and offerings and ways that people can tap in and connect to you. Well, apart from, I, I really suggest you know, it doesn't matter, by the way, which side of the world you're on, buy, I would buy this book and, and read and read this chapter. I'm assuming the other chapters, it's the whole thing is on mentoring and well-being. And is there something that we need more right now for educators? We need well-being, right? And here's your pathway to it. And I can assure you there's something for everyone in here. There's all kinds of little different ways. Um, but I'm curious if you could share some of the, I, I have to ask this directly just because I think people will be wondering um, before I get into some of the ideas you have about that, that how people could tap in and, 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 and learn with you. Um, how do you fund yourselves? Where is the funding coming from, you know, that, that keeps, that keeps you alive and out there listening, you know, and how can people tap in? And cause I mean, you know, are you, you running on, on big hearts and fumes basically, or is there, yeah, I'm curious. And, and I'm uh, asking uh, in a genuine way. Yeah. <laughs> Really important to us that we have free offerings, especially because we want to invite pre-service teachers and, you know, for the financial realities for many pre-service teachers and even some teachers today um, have to make the, the access the most important thing for a lot of it. But so we have two models where they it costs to participate, whether it's impact or motivators. Motivators is run by a mentor and it can be an hour, an hour and a half. Sometimes it's a workshop. Sometimes it's whatever the mentor wants it to be. And we don't have to wait for, you know, a conference necessarily or applying for something that might not be accessible physically for people to be able to go and lead. People can say, listen, I have some expertise on this and I want to lead it. So that's something that we support. And um, that's one of the ways we finance ourselves. and impact is another one. So those are the the two primary things, but we also do consulting work um, and we're happy to support, you know, your organization, your school in developing or even tweaking their mentorship opportunities, but mostly it's a bootstrap kind of experience. And um, as much as we're still looking at sustainability as we scale up for us and even for me who covers any extra expenses out of pocket for now, the truth yeah. is that sometimes you just have to build it and then they will come believe and that's kind of where the impetus of sharing this was okay we've built something now we're ready to get it out there and see what happens and we're open to lots of different kinds of conversations and partnerships and collaborations so i i, I i'm sure others have something to say but i have to say i i you know, the out of pocket, like that tells you about the heart behind this organization. And for those of you out there that might be considering, and I'm going to ask a, uh, for some examples, but where it could be applied, uh, but the Merit Center, we contracted, I contracted this team right here to build our mentorship training for our, our uh, for the Merit Center. So 
that's a, you know, and I can tell you afterwards, I'm still highly recommending. So, uh, you know, those of you out there with some, with some funding, you know, school leaders or whatever, and you're like, okay, I, I really think there's a nice intersection for it. it. It could intersect with all kinds of things, including self-reg or mental health or safe schools or like, there's really no right or wrong. If you've got a team, you know, I hear this over and over again, we know we want to do this work. We want to get to the professional learning and the efficacy matters, but the team is burnt out. They can't take one more thing. What a lovely intersection to say, okay, let me, you know, it's a very, you're developing as you go. I mean, you have, you have some set ways of doing things, but the content is decided by locally, right? What a, what a really neat way to come, come in and work with a, a school board or, or, you know, early childhood educators or whoever, and to come in and say, okay, we're here as a mentoring and maybe, maybe the school has their expert in whatever content area that they're looking at getting, but they can't get to that until we actually have a chance to, to get, get the team feeling better, get hearing, you know, it, you talk a lot in your, it's in your chapter, but I'm sure it's in your website as well, but it's really who, who decides is the one that always jumps out to me. I love that saying from Robert Chalmers, like who, who decides and that things are coming from inwards, outwards. I mean, you can have this goal and you can say, okay, well, we really need, we have this new directive. So those of you not from Ontario, it was a de-streaming of grade 10, uh, it was math and English or both, but it was, it felt really plunked on, on, you know, on, on Ontario, but it doesn't matter where you're from. You've had something like that come from above that felt plunked on you. And even if you looked at it and said, oh, I'm, I'm good with this, but I'm not ready for it. Well, there's the whole, all the emotion stressors, like all the things, the injustice, that's a pro-social stressors, the confusion, cognitive, st- that, that, that come along with that. There's this little gap in between. And what can I do with that space? And how can I honor my team, the staff, who I know we need to move forward in professional learning, but they just aren't ready. And I can't thou shalt. And, you know, where's this little intersection? Well, what a lovely place to bring the mentoree in you know, to, to maybe help facilitate some of that and, and begin working on, on some of these, you know, having it coming from within, but working on these mentoring relationships as well. That's just one idea. I don't know. What else, what else do you want to tell the world about how they can find you or other ideas or even just respond to what I just shared? We'd love to have conversations and we love to collaborate. So thank you, Susan. Really, you are at the forefront of those opportunities. We continue to build relationship with faculties across Ontario, and we would really like to continue doing that. We've been having amazing conversations with the Canadian School Libraries Association and other kinds of organizations that support educators. And there's a lot of different ways that we can help you with your mentorship program or help you rethinking mentorship in a in a broader and more self-directed way. So just reach out to us, info at thementory.com or each of us, noah.daniel at thementory.com, christine.chin terry.rubinoff at thementory.com. Reach out to us, plan a conversation. Maybe we'll do an episode together and see what unfolds of on ed mentors. And maybe you'll join the community and start leading some work there. So there's lots of different ways to get involved um, deeply or even superficially, although we prefer deeply. And let's just start with hello. I <laughs> love it. Terry, anything to add? I just, you know, I mean, there are, we're, we are open to so many opportunities, you know, uh, Christine in particular, I think was talking a lot about how we are a community of, of learners, of mentors, we support each other, we want to grow the community. Um, we also want to respond to the community. So we, you know, develop opportunities based on what on what people in the community are telling us they need, they want in terms of content and in terms of structure. So, you know, come join the community. There are so many different ways to, um, to get involved. And, you know, it's also about, uh, we know that sometimes there can be stressors involved in jumping into something new and connecting to people you may not know, but we are very welcoming and, uh, and open. And, you know, you can start wherever it's comfortable for you. Uh, so check us out and see what, what speaks to you and where you want to start. And, uh, and if you have questions, like Noah said, get in touch with any of us and we are happy to, uh, to talk and support you, um, on your mentorship journey. Absolutely. I think if anything I would say about us is just, we're very welcoming people. We would love, love, love to have you. Um, and we love connecting with new people, honestly. Like I think that my professional learning network in the past 
what, three, four years has expanded immensely. And I think that Mm -hmm. um, if anything, just connecting with people, it's a really great place to connect with people. And then if you happen to feel like you have, you know, um, a really great vibe with someone, it's an opportunity for you to kind of go deeper. And I think that in our education world, sometimes it can feel really isolating. And I know there's that quote, there's no better professional learning than that person down the hall. But I think that sometimes that person down the hall can be really intimidating. And so the mentor is kind of that solution where you can talk to someone who's not in your building and ask those questions without worrying that someone's going to judge you or whatever it may be, right? So um, if anything, I feel like we're a place of connection and to really think about how um, connecting with a whole bunch of other educators who might be like-minded could really be beneficial to you. Well, thank you, Christine, Terry, and Noah. It's been a a really interesting conversation. I hope everybody buys the book, Mentoring for Wellbeing in Schools, and gets to read your chapter. And uh, you'll feel the same thing that I've been telling you. It's a pretty incredible chapter. And thank you for the work you do. You're making a difference for so many people. I told the one story in the beginning of, of, of Hoda, one, um, one mentee who, who really had made a difference. And yet you're in all these different places and now you're trying to expand, you know, well beyond the borders of, of, of Ontario to others as well. And I just, I know you make a difference for so many people. And I just want to say, thank you. You're, 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 uh, very special humans. And, uh, and I'm just, I'm, I'm honored that you took this time today to have a conversation with me. So thank you everyone. Thank you for everything you guys do. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you.